Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Ezel. I'm the Federal Society's Vice President for our Lawyers Division, and I want to take a brief moment here to thank all of you for attending our 2022 Ohio Chapters Conference. Um, for Michigan native, I think the April Fool's joke is on me since I'm firmly immersed in, in, in Buckeye territory today, but I am truly delighted to be here. Um, I want to offer my deepest thanks and gratitude to our volunteer leaders here in Ohio who have worked so hard on our agenda today. Uh, Robert Alt and Jedediah Bresman from our Columbus chapter, Patrick Lewis from our Cleveland chapter, and Joey Ashbrook in Cincinnati. We're looking for new volunteers to get involved in our other chapters in Ohio. I think we have our Toledo leader here, we have some of our Dayton uh, leaders here, and we'd like to encourage all of you to get more involved in our chapters across the state. I also want to acknowledge my staff, particularly Jana Bodor and Hannah Kanasik. This is their first time at the Ohio Chapters Conference, so thank you. Uh, I want to thank them particularly because they did so much of the work for this event. And if you have not met them yet, please introduce yourselves. So I'm going to put in a quick couple of plugs. One is um, we just came from, I think, a fully packed room where we launched our Ohio Lawyers Chapter, Young Lawyers Chapter. And uh, I want to thank our leadership there for, in the state for helping us to launch that event. If you'd like to get more involved, please do so. And I want to particularly welcome all of the students here. I know I met some from Capitol, from Akron, from Ohio State. Thank you so much for being here, and we're really glad that you got involved this early. And please stay involved with FedSoc. We have a very, very full agenda today, leading off with our candidate forum for the Ohio Supreme Court. We are so pleased all of the candidates for Chief Justice and Associate Justice have joined us here today. We pride ourselves on debate and discussion at the Federal Society, and this discussion is a prime example of that. And as a reminder, we do not take positions or endorse candidates, so um, please you know, enjoy the very robust back and forth we'll have. We have a great um, agenda after that, as well as keynote remarks delivered by our good friend Chief Judge Bill Pryor from the 11th Circuit, visiting us from Alabama. So a couple of quick housekeeping items. One, CLE information is available on the back of your program, so you can scan that in with your phone. And if you have trouble with that, I think Jana or Hannah can help you with that. Um, secondly, if you're gonna be entering and exit the room, please use the, room, the door in the back so we can um, minimize the number of disruptions at the front of the room for the stage. So with that, um, I'm going to you know, thank you once again for your dedication and support for the Federalist Society. I want to thank Patrick Lewis for who put this, helped assemble this opening panel. And with that, I'm going to introduce Robert Alt, who is going to be moderating our opening discussion. Robert is a president and chief executive officer of the Buckeye Institute, and he's also a former Columbus Lawyers Chapter president. He's a proud graduate of the University of Chicago, and he clerked for our good friend, Judge Alice Batchelder, who will be participating in one of our panels later today. Um, Robert, thank you so much for your leadership in Ohio, and I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Lisa, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to see all of you here today and to be able to host all the candidates for the Ohio Supreme Court. I'd like to, once again, just reiterate Lisa's uh, 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 sort of caveat that the Federalist Society is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization which takes no position on any races for public office. We do, however, uh, encourage spirited debate, and we look forward to having that today. We're going to lead off with the two candidates for Chief Justice, each of whom will have 10 minutes to deliver an opening statement, which uh, puts me in an interesting position. Ordinarily, judges give the advocates the red light, but today the tables are turned, uh, and I will make sure that these uh, judicial candidates keep their allotted time. Showing that I was not uh, eligible to participate in the Young Lawyers chapter, I keep time in the tradition of uh, the late Chief Justice William Rehnquist, which is to say that when your time is up, you may finish your sentence, but not your paragraph or page. So with that, uh, allow me to introduce our, our first speaker today, Justice Bruner. Uh, who is a justice on the Supreme Court of Ohio. She previously served on the 10th District Court of Appeals and the Franklin County Common Pleas Court. She was Ohio's first female Secretary of State. She graduated from Miami University with a degree in Sociology, Gerontology, Cum Laude, and Capital University School of Law with honors. Please join me in welcoming Justice Bruner.
Thank you, Robert, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, a hello to my colleagues, Justice Kennedy, Justice Fisher, Justice DeWine, and uh, as many uh, former Justice uh, De Janeiro, I believe, here is, is here today, too. Uh, it's appropriate that you have law students here today, considering that this organization uh, started basically out of a law student conference in 1982. And look at you today. Congratulations. So uh, in, when, in preparing my remarks for today, I thought maybe I should start with uh, John F. Kennedy's speech about being a liberal that he delivered in the 1960, con uh, his campaign. But I knew that probably wouldn't be right for this group because it was about the executive branch, not the judicial branch. So April Fool's. Uh, <laughs> so I thought it would be better to start with my own thoughts about the judiciary because I do have quite a few. I never seem to stop thinking. Uh, for me, an independent judiciary is foundational to democracy. Uh, our independent judiciary is a co-equal branch of the government and is not a creature of any other branch of the government. A judge's first loyalty should be to the rule of law regardless of party affiliation or ideological leaning, conservative or liberal or somewhere in between. The desire should be to get it right in fairness to the parties. A judge must never lose sight that she is a public servant and that reverence for the rule of law is what best serves the public. A belief in the rule of law is a belief in something better than any one individual. It is a belief that a democratic rule of law forms a government that keeps us safe, creates predictability, and when done in, in the best fashion, provides in the best scenario a springboard for the pursuit of happiness by individuals. Because I am a public servant, my aim is to serve people even as a judge. I must be impartial, fair, curious, learned, careful, persistent, patient, a good listener, and again, independent. It has been said that many politicians lack self-observation, but this is an essential characteristic for judges, elected or not. Decision makers should understand what motivates them to make decisions. And this is important in public service because we want to make sure that what we do is in the public's best interest, not according to personal, political, or private interests. Judges in their discretion are often called on to balance competing interests. For instance, the four factors or requirements for the issuing of a preliminary injunction require factual judgment and weighing and balancing of those factors and that legal precedent often provides guide rails, but in the end, judgment is exercised. So perhaps the most valuable quality of a judge is this intangible trait of judgment. That is, the ability to make considered decisions or come to sensible conclusions. And this involves discernment, which is often defined as perception in the absence of judgment. To me, this describes impartiality. Being human, as we grow with the love of learning and humility to understand that we will never know it all, our experience teaches us this discernment. My discernment has taught me the sanctity of the separation of the powers of the three branches of our government in this United States and in this state of Ohio. It's a delicate balance that involves what one would say is not legislating from the bench. This means not adding requirements to a legislative enactment. For example, if a statute provides that an inmate may request under certain conditions a, re a review of his or her jail time credit for error, a court cannot add a requirement and say that the inmate, in making the request, must provide an affidavit or a transcript. Now, while the statute, as written, judges would recognize could really clog court dockets or create more work for the prosecutor and the judge, the judgment of whether that is acceptable lies with the legislature and not with the courts. But yet, when a court is called on to exercise its power, even in the face of blistering criticism, the court should act carefully, considering the limits of its charge, but it should act. People are depending on it. According to the state constitution, the jurisdiction of the state's lower courts is set by the legislature, while the Supreme Court derives its power to act from the state constitution. The state constitution also provides for the superintendence of the courts by the Chief Justice 
according to the rules of superintendents. Being Chief Justice is less about jurisprudence and more about the direction and administration of the state's courts and their dedication to the rule of law and the public trust. Being Chief Justice is about respecting the diversity of our state's courts among the varied communities of Ohio, rural and urban, mid-sized cities, and small villages. It is about understanding trial court responsibilities, appellate standards of review, and how superintendents of these courts and refinement of case law by the state's highest court can be accomplished peaceably with public trust and in concert with the other branches of government. I've been privileged to serve at all three levels of the state's judiciary and have, have administered a state agency, the Office of the Secretary of State. That office similarly involves superintendents of local operations of independent bodies, like boards of elections in all 88 counties. And like elections, our independent courts are a functional pillar of democracy. And democracy, being very fragile, works best when it is trusted by those who have consented to be governed. I've been privileged to serve as a rule of law expert for the State Department in Serbia and in Sri Lanka, to observe three elections in the Arab Republic of Egypt after the Arab Spring, and to remotely teach in Kazakhstan the fundamentals of civic participation, all in fragile and struggling democracies. Firsthand, I have seen that the rule of law is not a thing to be taken for granted. While intangible, without it, the human suffering can be palpable. Lawyers and judges are the guardians of the rule of law, however it is expressed or defined in a particular culture. They are trained as no one else in protecting and defending a society's unspoken spirit that exists in its rule of law. Accordingly, the Chief Justice controls when a judge must recuse, except in the case of a Supreme Court justice, and who shall be appointed to replace the judge who cannot serve in a particular case. Chief Justice names judges to courts of claims to exercise judgment concerning matters important to state action. Finally, the chief leads the court in self-governance and attorney education to help the state's legal profession be the best it can be in service to the people and in protecting the rule of law that exists for their well-being. So while those among us may focus on ideological differences labeled conservative or liberal or somewhere in between, I believe we all can agree that the higher ground we can reach together is through the rule of law that calls on each of us to serve one another. I've come to believe that when we leave this earth, all we really have to show for the time we've been here is what we have done in service to others. So as lawyers and judges, there remains much to be done. As a potential Chief Justice, I will work to bridge the divides rather than turn my back on the chasm. I will always believe that bridges are the greatest paths to freedom and human progress in the face of seeming impossibility. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today and for your kindness in considering my remarks. While I know this format does not call for questions to either of the candidates for Chief Justice, I do remain open to them throughout this campaign. My website is jenniferbruner.com. Feel free to go to the contact section. I'll do my best to answer those questions for you. Thank you very much and God bless. set the standard by coming in under time. So, <laughs> Next up, we have Justice Sharon Kennedy, who is a justice on the Supreme Court of Ohio. She previously served as, as the uh, Butler County, on the Butler County Court of Common Pleas, Domestic Relations Division, uh, and as a police officer. She graduated from the University of Cincinnati with a degree in social work uh, and the University of Cincinnati College of Law. Please join me in welcoming Justice Kennedy. Well, good morning. Thank you to the organizers of the conference and for the invitation to speak. And thank you to all of you in attendance. I'm honored to be here. The influence of the Federalist Society on the federal judiciary has been so marked that in March of 2021, the Harvard Gazette highlighted the Harvard Law School professor Noah Feldman piece entitled Takeover, how a conservative student club captured the Supreme Court noting that six of nine of the current justices of the United States Supreme Court are current or former members of this organization. It begs the question, how did your organization achieve that? 
According to your platform, this organization is, and I quote, committed to the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be, end quote. If that platform, mere, merely adhering to the founder's belief, and the words of the Federalist Papers can influence the selection of federal judiciary, just think what you can do to the other two branches of federal government. But with that mark of influence comes at a cost. You are the organization. You are now the watchman for the erosion of our Constitution. Fundamentally, we believe that the same Constitution that gives power also constrains power. And when the three branches of government respect those limits, the Constitution is preserved. In my view, so long as the judicial branch adheres to the limitation of its constitutional power, the Constitutional will always be preserved and the cause of individual freedom and limited government will never cease to exist. If you believe that government exists to protect and preserve individual freedom, then how does the Constitution achieve it? Is, it an individual, is, it, is the individual freedom protected because the Constitution is written on parchment? If that were the only requirement that it is written, then the people of the former Soviet Union would never have cause to fear their government, nor would we. Or is individual freedom protected because the Constitution divides power amongst three separate but co-equal branches of government? Maybe. The Constitution is unique to America. Its division of governmental power between three separate and co-equal branches is unparalleled. It is what separates our government from oppressive forms of government. With the consolidation of power in a single body comes the ability to trample the liberty of all people. As James Madison wrote in Federalist Paper 47, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced to be the very definition of tyranny. And the same is true with the objective principles of the Constitution of a limited government. I often speak to civic organizations about the separation of powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, and the layers of separation that the founders created within the Constitution, that horizontal view. But it's really the conversation of the vertical view of what the founders gave us in the Constitution that is most impactful, that separation from federal to local. As Thomas Jefferson once said, the only way to have a good, safe government is not to trust it all to one, but divide it among the many, distributing to every exactly what function he is competent to. Let the national government be entrusted with the defense of nations and its foreign and federal regulations, the state governments with civil rights, laws, police, and administration of what the state is generally, the counties with local concerns, and each ward directs the interest within itself. But in my view, individual freedom and liberty government cannot survive without a judiciary that exercises judicial restraint. Over the years, every judicial nominee or candidate pledges allegiance to judicial restraint. They promise to leave policy making to the legislature and the executive function to the executive branch. But how often have we heard in the echo of time? That statement was an apparition. For those who seek to normalize judicial activism, they like to say that it is rightly the balance of powers of government and to permit the judiciary to advance society by extending standards of rules, of interpretation to achieve economic, social, or individual objectives. But it misses the point. Judicial activism always presents a real danger to the Constitution in our democracy because, and I quote, there is no democracy without constitutional judicial review. As Justice Scalia said, words have meaning, and that meaning doesn't change. And when that meaning doesn't change, and it's applied to everyone in a fair and impartial manner, we preserve the Constitution, our democracy, and we advance equal protection under the law. 
How long would individual freedom or limited government exist if judicial review becomes unmoored from the text of the Constitution or a statutory provision? Yes, a nimble government, a legislature, could cabin the harm done by judicial activism to a statute. But limiting that harm to a constitutional provision is an entirely different matter. Reversing the violence done to the Constitution is a lengthy process. In Ohio, it requires a citizen's referendum or a joint resolution of the General Assembly, and both require a vote of the people. It takes time, and how much damage to the democracy occurs in that time. Judicial legitimacy is confined to ourselves in interpreting only the, the written words. Despite what some believe, textualism and originalism, it does not exclude judicial discretion. The government is not a source of our power. The will of the people is the source of governmental power. And the exercise of power beyond that scope is illegitimate. As former Justice Cook once said, we should be concerned by the use of judicial power to advance a particular social philosophy. When judges declare that governmental actions are unconstitutional based upon personal distaste for the policies adopted through the legislative process, we cease to be governed by our democracy. But we should be equally concerned about judicial activism that usurps the executive function under the guise of the administration of justice. Imagine a judiciary who usurps the function of the legislative and executive branches and begins to dismantle step by step our criminal justice system. The protections that the American justice system provo provides and affords to both defendants and victims and safety to our communities. Thomas Jefferson warned that if the three powers maintain mutual independence of each other, our government may last long. But if either can assume the authorities of the other, it will not. In 2004, it was a member of your organization who wrote an article saying the Ohio Supreme Court, a court at the crossroads. In the pages that follow, he highlighted what he perceived was judicial activism. In one of those cases, DeRolf versus State, he highlighted the fact that the court had become not only the final arbiter of public policy, but also controlled the budget of the state. The author concluded by saying and quoting Justice Cook, the court's ill-conceived foray outside the legitimate role is the most serious affront to individual freedom and our democratic ideals. By not abiding by the American form of government, we invite a lessening of the public trust in the court as an institution. He concludes his remarks by saying, in the past, the court's activism and its new direction, the upcoming elections will have a significant impact on public policy and the law and rule of Ohio. Elections will determine whether the court returns to its activism past or whether the court will conclude or continue down its new path of returning to the judicial role as a neutral independent arbiter. Clearly, he says, the Ohio Supreme Court is at a crossroads. End quote. 18 years later, are we at the crossroads again? Thank you for your time today. May God bless all of you. Thank you to both of the Chief Justice candidates. At this point, let's have the candidates for the Supreme Court come up uh, and assume their seats, and I will will introduce them in turn. Uh, they're, they're all very distinguished. I'm going to give relatively short uh, biographical introductions as they each have uh, ample time to make a, a statement, in which case I'm, I'm sure they will highlight features of their own background. Uh, first, first up, we have uh, uh, R. Patrick DeWine, who is a justice on the Supreme Court of Ohio. He previously served on the First District Court of Appeals and the Hamilton County Common Pleas Court. He is an adjunct professor at the University of Cincinnati College of Law, where he teaches appellate practice and procedure. He graduated from Miami University, summa cum laude, and the University of Michigan Law School with Order of the Coif Honors. Next up, we have Patrick Fisher, uh, who is also a justice on the Supreme Court of Ohio. He previously served on the First District Court of Appeals. He graduated with honors from Harvard College and Harvard Law School. 
Then we have Terry Jamison, who is a judge on Ohio's 10th District Court of Appeals. She previously served on the Franklin County Common Pleas Court, Division of Domestic Relations and Juvenile Bench, or Branch, pardon me. She joined the United Mine Workers and became one of the few women who worked as an underground coal miner. She graduated from Franklin University with a degree in Business Administration, cum laude, and Capital University School of Law. Finally, we have Marilyn Zayas, uh, who is a judge on Ohio's First District Court of Appeals. She previously served in private practice. She graduated from City College of, this, of the City University of New York with a degree in Computer Science and the University of Cincinnati College of Law. As I stated before, each of the candidates will have time to make an opening statement. Uh, following that, I will go ahead and ask a few questions before opening it up to audience questions. So as you're listening, be thinking about uh, potential questions you may wish to ask the candidates as well. With that, please join me in welcoming Justice DeWine. Thank you, Robert, and thanks to the Federal Society for hosting this event. This is you know, really great. You know, in a world where forums for the unfettered exchange of ideas seem to be shrinking, I am grateful to the Federal Society and its robust commitment to free and open debate. Uh, so we've been asked to talk about the role of a justice. I'm going to kind of talk about four areas uh, that I think are critical to our role. Protection of constitutional freedoms, our limited and constrained but important role, the creation of a stable and predictable legal environment, and the rule of law. No question, the most important thing we do as judges is to enforce the guarantees of individual rights and the limitations on government that are found in our state and federal constitutions. I'm an unabashed originalist. That means we apply those documents based upon their original public meaning. And we rely on text, structure, history, and tradition to understand that meaning. We do that because, at least I do that, because any other interpretive mechanism simply invites judges to insert their own policy preferences instead of what the documents actually were intended to mean. Uh, when I look back at my past five years in the court, I think some of the things I'm most proud of are the painstaking historical research and analysis we did to derive the original meanings of state and federal constitution, state, the state and federal constitution, when, when we had issues in front of us. For example, uh, the Weber case. Uh, we did a very extensive research to understand the original public meaning of the right to bear arms this, under the Second Amendment. Uh, and ultimately, we came to the conclusion that we would reject the interest balancing test that most of the federal circuits have used for the, for the Second Amendment, intermediate scrutiny, uh, a test that really relegated the Second, Second Amendment to a second class right. Uh, instead, the conclusion that I came to was that rules that burden the Second Amendment must be evaluated based upon the scope of that right as it was originally understood. Not, not a balancing test, but what's the, what was the historical understanding of the scope of that right. Uh, this kind of analysis is even more important when it comes to our state constitution. Uh, I'm a firm believer that we should not be following lockstep federal interpretations uh, of the U.S. Constitution saying the Ohio Constitution means the same thing, whether rather we have an obligation to understand the original meaning of the Ohio Constitution. And that's not easy. It's not, there's not a lot of law review articles, other historical uh, research done in the Ohio Constitution. So we have to do a lot of it ourselves. Uh, uh, but I'm proud of the fact that in our chambers we've, we've done that. So, and we've written some, I think, some very uh, important decisions on what the Ohio Constitution really means. Uh, protecting individual liberties. That means sometimes you have to be willing to take positions that aren't always popular. Uh, we recently had a case where the majority on the court voted to suspend an attorney for a year because 
he accused some Ohio Supreme Court justices of making decisions for political reasons. That got him a year suspension. Think about that. After all, judges, if anything, were public officials. And if the Constitution guarantees anything, it guarantees citizens the right to criticize public officials, including judges. So I wrote, I think, probably what was one of my uh, most vociferous dissents in that case, because our role is to, is to protect constitutional freedoms, even when it's not uh, convenient. It's fair to say that the courts, particularly federal courts, I guess, have taken on a role that far exceeds the scope of what our framers intended. Now, part of that, no doubt, is a reaction to legislative and executive power, the unchecked growth of that, uh, and the creation of an administrative state that exceeds anything our framers intended. But I think there's also a tendency on both the right and the left to seek to accomplish their goals through any means necessary. And that has led to courts too often becoming battlegrounds for issues that are best left for the legislative process. There's something to be said for judicial modesty. As judges, we are less accountable to the people than any other branch of government. We are less representative of the people as a whole than the other branches of government. And when we constitutionalize areas of, areas of the law, we move them outside of the normal democratic process, making our decisions hard to revisit and recalibrate. So as judges, it's critical that we practice restraint. That is not to say we should, ab we should abdicate our judicial role to say what the law is and to protect the liberties that are enshrined in our state and federal constitutions, but it is to say that we shouldn't, our role is not to make policy. Our, law, our role is to apply the law. Over the past few years, one of the things I think I've devoted the most attention to is the area of administrative deference. I've written several opinions on the topics. I wrote an uh, article that was in the Yale Journal of Regulations, Notes, and Comments. Uh, so why do I care about this issue? It's kind of a boring, abstract, administrative issue. I care about it because I think it really gets to areas at the core of the separation of powers in our democratic system. At bottom, it asks the question is when, if ever, is it appropriate for judges to hand over their constitutional responsibility to say what the law is to unelect, unelected bureaucrats? That's a pretty central question in our experiment of self-government. If we do our job right as Supreme Court, and as judges generally, what we do is we create a stable and predictable legal environment in the state. Now, I have to admit, it's a campaign's talking point, stable and predictability is pretty boring. People don't actually get up and start jumping up and down when you start talking about that. But it's pretty important if you want to have a prosperous state. There's a reason that, that people don't invest in third world countries. And a big part of that is they don't know what the legal rules are. The legal rules are subject to changing, and property rights aren't protected. And those of us who've um, been alive a little while, uh, we remember when the Ohio Supreme Court was pretty stable and unpredictable. Uh, businesses literally left the state because of the legal environment in Ohio. We are in danger, I think, of going back. We are, as Justice Kennedy said, at crossroads. We're in danger of going back to that point. We have to have a court that's stable and predictable. And so that brings me to the subject of statutory interpretation. I'm a textualist. Uh, the best way to obtain predictability in the law is to apply the plain language of what, what is in front of us, as that language was understood at the time the statute was enacted. We do, when we do that, we create predictability. People know what the rules are because they understand the method the court is going to use to apply those rules. They understand that the plain language is, is what controls. And we create fairness when we do that because the same rules are applicable to everyone. That brings me to my last point, protection of the rule of law. The role of, our role is a little different than other judges. We're, we have administrative responsibilities, rulemaking responsibilities, as well as our adjudicated responsibilities. And if we want people to invest in the state, if we, if we want people to want to raise families in the states, we have to have safe neighborhoods where the rule of law is protected. 
Uh, let me give you one example. The courts, you may have, you probably haven't heard about a case that came out of the court last year, end of last year, DuBose. But in that case, what the Supreme Court said, it was a four to three decision, again, I was in the dissent, but what it said was, despite the fact that criminal rule 46 says judges have to consider the safety of the community when setting bail, the court said public safety should not be a consideration in setting bail amounts. That's a that's contrary to the text of the rule, and that's and that and that's and that's pretty pretty dangerous. Uh, none of what the majority decided was based on text or precedent; it was simply a policy decision. And when we have judges making policy instead of applying the law, we create problems. Uh, we live in a great state, and the most important thing we can do as a court to, to make this an even better state is to adhere to the constitutional framework created by our founders apply our Constitution based upon its original public meaning, recognize that our duty is not, to, is not to make the law, but to apply the law, create a stable and predictable legal environment by applying the laws as written, and protect the rule of law. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks for being asked back. Been here many times. I'm going to try not to repeat what the two prior speakers have said, so you're not bored out of your mind. But my views are very similar, but a little different. First, I want to talk about the rule of law. Rule of law is based upon courts being independent, impartial, and having integrity. Independence is crucial. And a lot of people say, oh, they're independent. In the year 2000, the head of the Russian government, named Putin, dismissed all the judges, put in his own. Boris Yeltsin had put in independent judges. Look where we are today. It matters who was the judge. Impartiality is really based upon a lot of matters, but one of which people forget is stare decisis. It makes the court an impartial arbiter because it's not always changing, which adds to the stability that Justice DeWine just mentioned. If we uphold stare decisis, except for under extraordinary circumstances, and there's case law telling when that would be, we are a better state. We are stable, certain, and that makes for a good environment for people as well as business. It also prevents abrupt changes in people's lives. When I was a young lawyer, the Gang of Four on the Ohio Supreme Court, literally I got called in to talk to a company. The case had gone against them. We couldn't meet for three weeks. By then, the Supreme Court of Ohio had gone 180 degrees the other way. How do you as a lawyer advise your clients if the Supreme Court of Ohio is not consistent? It's impossible. It's impossible for them to do business. Now, people characterize me, rightfully, as a common sense textualist. Because I look at the words, and words have meaning, and I even have to admit, sometimes I go back to junior high and diagram the sentence, if you all remember that, to get what it means. And I've told my friends in the legislature, please work with the Legislative Services Commission, because grammar is not their favorite way of writing. <laughs> but what that does, it keeps the court focused on what the issue is, whether it's the Constitution, the statute, or a contract, and not into policy. For policy must be made at the State House or in a contract, not at the courthouse. And we must keep that in mind. And we also have to keep in mind that everyone out here is subject to two constitutions protected, and words have meaning. And yes, for decades, the Ohio Supreme Court said, well, due process, equal protection. We'll just follow whatever the US Supreme Court does. It's wrong. The 14th Amendment, written by an Ohioan named John Brigham, says that there shall be equal protection under the law. The Ohio Constitution says that governments are instituted 
for the equal protection and benefit of their citizens. How can those mean exactly the same? Those words are not the same. They're not even close. And he would have known of that writing because our Constitution is 1851, and he wrote the 14th Amendment in 1866. Words have meaning and must be enforced as written. So I'm not going to go over a lot of the stuff you already heard. I'm going to talk about some more practical things that Supreme Court justices do. One, efficiency of the courts. We have a committee that's looking at things we've learned from COVID and Zoom, other than the phrase, you're on mute. <laughs> we have distributed about $8 million in grants to various courts to update them. We've had rule changes, and we're doing more. The other thing is the Ohio courts of the 21st century need more, a little updating. The last major amendment to the courts for us was 1968, the Modern Courts Amendment. We internally, I've pushed this both at, when I was at Court of Appeals and here, like for example, all of you filed jurisdictional motions. Did you know that we've cut down the average time for us to make a decision from 125 days to about 75 days? Minor changes in process have stepped up the efficiency of the court, and we need that in the 21st century because people will not wait for decisions the way they used to. They just don't because of computers or whatever. We've done that. Miscellaneous motions like uh, uh, delayed uh, appeals, motions for reconsideration, applications for reopening, and even admissions matters. We're trying to add some more. The other thing we oversee your money, the 350 bucks you spend every two years to register, it goes to important things. It doesn't go to us. It goes to things like OLAP, Ohio Lawyers Assistance Program. Now, maybe I'm biased because I spent decades on the Hamlin County Mental Health and Recovery Services Board. But when the University of Wisconsin put out an article in their journal confirming what I always thought, I always thought that Judge, uh, judges and lawyers were three times more likely in the population to have the illness of alcoholism or drug addiction. I was wrong. It, according to the University of Wisconsin, it's 2.8. But that means, because the population of the United States as a whole is 7% would have those diseases, that means about 20% of lawyers, one in five out here. So things like OLAP and, and, and programs, to help all of you are very important. We also, as justices, oversee ethics, grievances, and professionalism. I have uh, chaired ethics committees, bar associations, vice chair, commission on professionalism long before I was on the Supreme Court, but we have to act sooner. The public does not like unethical lawyers, and it's not good for our profession. As for professionalism, how many here of the young lawyers out there with less than six years? How many of you have been signed up for the mentoring program? Okay. Now, how many of you with more than six years are signed up to be mentors? Ah, <laughs> we need you to do that because those traditions, those relationships between generations are being harmed and are even being harmed further post COVID or I call it BC, or AD after uh, pandemic, after demic. Because at first it was an epidemic, then it was a pandemic, so it's after demic. But even before that, BC, before COVID, those relationships were being tethered farther apart. And that generational interaction and wisdom needs to be invigorated. I beg you, if you have more than six years of practice, sign up to be a mentor and help a young lawyer. As for grievances, we took a, a task force that I was involved with. Anybody guess how long it took from when somebody called and complained about a lawyer to us issuing an opinion before we made the changes last year? 890 days on average, almost 900 days more than two years, almost three. Ridiculous. 
One case I remember when I was at Cincinnati Bar, <laughs> the person who had called had forgotten when they told him what had happened. We made a lot of changes. It looks like we're going to cut several hundred days off, but still, 600, 500 days seems too long. We cannot take that long if the courts are going to continue to be respected by the public. We also much must continue our emphasis on civic education. We have a beautiful building. On the outside, what's, it, what's the one, one of the sayings? Morality and education are the force and majesty of a free government. We have great programs. We the people for the young kids, mock trial, moot court, all that kind of things, but we need to do more. And the lawyers here, I hope you get involved because you must have lawyers of all race, religions, backgrounds, training, beliefs involved. And if you're not involved, you're not helping make that change. I also gave uh, op-ed to the Cincinnati Enquirer in August printed that the bar associations, ABA, state, and local, must get together and teach our citizens how to disagree without being disagreeable as we do as lawyers in court because that would lower the temperature and, and tension in our nation as a whole and be pretty good for the reputation of lawyers too. So I want to say thank you for inviting me again and that the role of a justice is, yes, it's got all the things about stare decisis and all that. There's a whole lot of other things going on and those things you can actually talk to us about. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. I do want to uh, recognize our sitting justices, retired justices, and um, former justices and judges. I am uh, Judge Terry Jamison, and I serve on the 10th District Court of Appeals. But before that, I grew up in West Virginia in a small town called Welch. And my first impact from the law and the changes that had to be done with the law was when Brown versus Board of Education was issued as a decision. Prior to that, I began school in segregated schools in West Virginia. But because of the implementation of the law, I was able to go into equal education and have an opportunity to also be able to be educated with everyone else. So when we talk about the um, contextualism of the Constitution and the things that were written, when they were written, I would not have been considered a person. So I look at the law from a very different perspective because I understand that the role of a judge is to give equal protection under the law. It is to give us the right to have equal rights in this United States. There are many that believe that the Bill of Rights gives too many personal rights and that it should not have been accepted along with the Constitution. But if it were not for the, some of the amendments to the Constitution and for the Bill of Rights, many of us would not have the privileges that we have in the United States today. When I think about the law, yes, I believe in the rule of law and I my judicial philosophy more closely aligns with Justice John Roberts. I believe that it's my job to call balls and strikes and to be an umpire and not to be part of the game. But I, there are times when the law, as it is written, is prejudicial. It is not doing the benefit of the general interest of the public. And there are times where the law has to be changed and it's up to a judge to make those changes. I truly believe in stare decisis, and whenever I am going to write an opinion or going to make a rule on a case, I do go back to the beginning. I go to look to see what legislature has said. I do look for precedent. I do look for all of those things. 
but I also look to make sure that equal protection under the law is being granted to everyone. I also believe that as a person, it's very important to me that I love mercy and that I do justice and I walk humbly before my God because I have to stand and give an answer to him for every decision that I make. So I do believe in that as well. I believe that the court should be empathetic. It should have the ability to understand and share the feelings of the community for which it serves. And as a member of the third branch of government, the judiciary, I understand the importance of giving litigants the opportunity to be heard and to give them an opportunity to be heard and to rule on their case in a way that is fair and equitable and continues to give the promise of equal justice under the law. It's a necessity that it become a reality for all Ohioans, not just for a separated segment of the population. It's important that when we answer, that we answer proposed implement, implementation of a criminal sentencing database. It is one of the things that 61 judges on the courts have voluntarily decided we need to collect this data and make sure that we're enforcing the laws equally, not only uh, based on race, but also based on the type of the crime, based on their criminal history, and based on safety to the community. My husband did 27 and a half years veteran of the Franklin County Deputies Department. And because of that, I know the importance of safety for those men and women that wear the uniform that are protecting us every day. I'm not in favor of any law that would put anyone in jeopardy. I am not in favor of a law that would uh, cause us to be a lawless society. But I am in favor of the law being applied to everyone equally and everyone being treated the same. But as we look at the precedent that's been set down through history, we see that the courts have been the ones to make the impact when legislature does get it wrong. That is the rule of law that we should follow. We do have the right to interpret what the legislator has written and make sure that it is constitutional. We have to make sure that it is applied equally and we have to make sure that every citizen has those rights protected. And that's the role of the court. I do believe that we should protect the rule of law. We should protect the members of society but I think it's very important that we also rule with empathy and understanding. The voting patterns that we show show that there aren't many uh, diverse judges on the panels here in the state of Ohio. And you would say, why is that important? I think it's important because perception is reality. When someone walks into the court and they feel that they are, there's no one there that looks like them, they feel that they will not be treated fairly. And that's their perception, that's their reality. The reality is that many judges do a very good job of at their job, but sometimes we don't have the empathy and we don't come across as understanding the litigants that are in front of us. We've had cases in the Supreme Court where we have capped litigation uh, fees and findings by the juries and we have rules in the court that say that if you cannot show a physical impairment that you should not be um, compensated for that. But we've seen that trauma has lasting effects for years on individuals. And we should be compensated for the trauma that's also there as well as the physical injury. There are many things that um, happen in the rule of law that I believe that we need to take further looks and we should be able to see that people need to be heard with empathy. I believe in the Constitution, I believe in the rule of law, but because of the acts of a court, the Supreme Court of the United States, I am able to stand here today as an equal person and not three-fifths of a person. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Judge Zayas. Good morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about myself. And as this is my first time speaking at the Federalist Society, that's what I would like to do. Because what I've learned as a judge is that we bring ourselves to the bench. So I want you to know who is Marilyn Zayas. So I currently serve on the First District Court of Appeals. This is my sixth year at the court. Um, in the time that I've been there, I've had the honor to be appointed and selected by the Chief Justice to come to the Supreme Court. Um, I am actually the first person of Latino heritage to serve um, at, to be elected to a Court of Appeals. And I've also been appointed by the Chief Justice to serve uh, by special assignment to four other appellate districts. Um, additionally, I was appointed by the Chief Justice to serve as a commissioner on the Board of, um, of, of Ethics and uh, of Professionalism and, and Ethics, which is the board that makes uh, determinations for uh, individuals that are applying for the bar and that the Bar Association sets their application aside. Before coming to Ohio, and by the way, this is April 1st, April Fool's Day, very important day for me. This is actually my 34th year anniversary of my first day at working at Procter & Gamble, um, which is what brought me here to Ohio 34 years ago. And, um, and I'll tell you a funny story. So my oldest brother is a, is a police officer and I, when I was moving and he found out that April Fools was my first day at P&G. He was like, are you sure that job is waiting for you, Marilyn? Because you're gonna go all the way from New York to Ohio. Are you sure that job is waiting for you? And I said, Peter, it's Procter & Gamble. <laughs> but um, I'm one of those folks that grew up in, um, in neighborhoods that you really don't wanna be caught outside once it was dark. Um, I grew up in a household that if you were to say that it was dysfunctional, I would say, thank you, you have elevated my home life. And I'm going to tell you what that did for me. And what that did for me is that it really showed me very clearly that I'm not lesser than and I'm not more than. And nobody in this room is lesser than or more than. And that's what really led me from leaving the golden handcuffs of Procter & Gamble and going to law school, which was not an easy decision for me. When I entered UC Law, I had three kids that were all under the age of four. And for those of you that know UC, it is a full-time program. I did it because the law is really the great equalizer. It's intended to be applied equally and blindly. That's what really led me to the law, was those experiences growing up and understanding what the law is. Because when people come to court, they're not coming to court because it's a happy day, it's a good day in their lives. You know, they're taking those issues and, and people, you know, whether it's people, whether it's government, whether it's a corporation, they're taking that very important issue and putting it into the hands of a judge to make that decision. And then when it comes on appellate review, you know, keep in mind the Court of Appeals oftentimes is the last court of resort and absolutely our Ohio Supreme Court is the absolute last court of resort. So anything that gets decided there becomes the law of the land that all Ohioans must follow. So, you know, it's interesting because when you're on the campaign trail, you hear these things like, you know, the rule of law judge and things of that nature. And we all say the same thing, right? We all say the same thing. Um, one thing that I find is ironic, you know, like it's not like there's somebody out there that's saying, hey, I'm advocating for crime. I haven't met that judge who's advocating for crime, you know. I'm hoping that what we're all advocating for is justice. So what is it that, you know, what is it that compelled me to run for the Supreme Court? The integrity and the independence of this co-equal branch of government is absolutely important. And yes, the rule of law does mean applying a statute as it is written. That is part of the rule of law. And if there's any doubt as to, because you know, people can say whatever they say in the campaign trail, it's what have you actually done, right? So if there's any doubt as to who I am, I brought some decisions with me. Decisions in which that's exactly what I said, that the statute is clear and unambiguous. 
that it should be applied as it was written. One of those cases where I wrote that it should be applied as it is written, I was the dissent. The majority was written by someone of a different political persuasion than I. Both of those cases were adopted by the Ohio Supreme Court. So when you grow up in these communities, what are you really looking for? You're looking to be treated equally. And again, that law is the great equalizer. The other thing that happens to you when you grow up in these communities is that you realize that you have a, you have a responsibility to leave things better than what they were. So I'm the only girl, I have three brothers. My oldest brother, Mr. Peter, April Fool's Day Peter, he was a law enforcement officer for his whole career until, his, until he was hit in the line of, of duty, and that ended his career. My other two brothers are teachers, and they have for over a decade been active in the Boy Scouts, both being troop leaders. So it compels you to want to make the world better because you don't want other people to go through hardships similar to what you've gone through. So for me, it's very important to serve on the bench and on the bench being a judge who I will tell you when I ran for re-election, I was supported by both public defenders and prosecutors. And off the bench to be a servant for the community. Uh, one of the things that I did on the court is I created a program, it's called Educating Tomorrow's Leaders. Um, I work with a lot of inner city students, but I also work with undergraduate and with law students. And, and I share with them my personal story. We talk about the judiciary. And my goal is that every child out there, no matter where they are, no matter what their background and circumstances, no matter what part of the state that they are living in, that they will dream big and that they will know that they can overcome every obstacle. Thank you so much. Thank you to, to each of the candidates. Uh, we unimaginatively went in alphabetical order uh, in terms of the, the, the lineup. Uh, so for the first question that I'll ask, we'll, we'll mix it up and go in reverse alphabetical order. Um, so uh, a case comes before the Ohio Supreme Court raising a novel question of statutory interpretation. There's no binding precedent. The court below expressed concern that the law as applied achieves results that were not intended by the legislature when the law was drafted. Briefs are filed with the court raising various sources. Assuming the quality of the material submitted to the court is high, which of the following sources would you rely upon in interpreting the statute and why? Sorry, frustrated former law professor here. <laughs> Non-binding authority from other courts, newspaper reports quoting the legislative sponsor of the bill explaining what the law was intended to do, dictionary definitions of words in the statute, a section-by-section -section summary of the bill from the Legislative Service Commission, which is the body tasked with assisting members of the General Assembly in their drafting of legislation, statutory text, canons of interpretation, a relevant academic social science study addressing the impact of this law, a public statement signed by more than 100 officials working for the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services, describing the tangible impact of this law on underserved communities, or a report by university economists assessing the effects of the law on small businesses. Again, uh, assuming the quality of these materials submitted to the court is high, which of the following sources would you rely upon in interpreting the statute and why? Uh, we'll go first to Judge Zayas. Was this like a memory test? <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, it wasn't clear, but um, in your question, uh, but I first looked to see whether the statute is clear and unambiguous. And I would start there before I would turn to anything further. And then depending on what, because all you said it was a novel, um, that means possibly an issue of first impression, um, but I would start off there. Uh, you know, and most statutes are clear and unambiguous. Uh, and then from there I go to statutory construction, 
Um, and then I, I you know, again, I, if it's a memory test, oh boy. <laughs> Well, not, not so much. I gave those as examples, but what sources, in, it, 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 to make it less of a memory test, what sources in general would you look to in, in interpreting a statute? Okay, if I needed to interpret the statute? Correct. Okay, in, in the circumstances where I felt that I needed to interpret the statute. Um, I mean, some of the things that I've looked at in the past are things like um, the, uh, and again, it's very, it's very rare, you know, there's notes when there's amendments to the statutes and sometimes the notes gives a little bit of guidance because you kind of see like where it was before and then where it is now and trying to understand like, okay, if this is the language before and this is the language now. Um, so that's one of the things that I've looked at in the past. Um, I don't know that I've ever looked beyond that at this point in my career. All right, Judge Jamison. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, I believe that we have to start with the, um, with the statute itself, the notes of the legislature to determine legislative intent. Then you would look for any precedent possibly in another jurisdiction that could have answered that question and that might be persuasive, um, but I'm more likely to rely upon the statute and if it's um, and I would look at the lower, the lower court's ruling to see how they interpreted it and um, look for uh, case laws within their ruling to see if they had found any particular case law that they relied upon. I do believe that you need to go outside of that and look at, um, um, if, because we are looking at questions of great general importance, I also would look at the other information that was submitted from ODJFS and other uh, organizations to see what their take on the consequences of the uh, legislation might be as well. I think because it's a case of first impression, you have to be very careful that when you issue that opinion, that it impacts the majority of the people in the correct way. Thank you. Justice Fisher? I would start, obviously, with the text. Um, I don't think I would care about the newspaper articles. Um, I would use the dictionary a little bit, make sure I've got the right wording, and canons of construction. Everything else is outside the record, it looks like, here, uh, the studies and the 100 people from JFS. So I, I would stick with those three, basically. Statutory con uh, text, dictionary, and canons of construction. Thank you. Justice DeWine. You know, when, when I get a question of statutory interpretation, uh, I start with the plain language of the statute, read, it, read in context of the statute. Uh, you know, as far as it, in, in, in reading the plain language, we apply the canons of statutory interpretation uh, I think, and sometimes you would need to look at a dictionary. There was some question about what a word meant, uh, but that's really it. I, you know, a lot, most of the things listed here are things that I don't think the judges ought to be considering. Uh, these questions about uh, what the legislative history was or what the bill sponsor said. To me, that's beyond what we should consider. Uh, you know, who knows why the legislature enacted some, something? There might be, there's 99 members of the Ohio General Assembly, there might be 50 different reasons why people voted for things. Uh, legislative history, legislative notes, those tend to be things that are put in afterwards, drafted not by, not by legislatures, not, not enacted into law by legislatures, but by, by staff members. I think that is irrelevant to the judges uh, Duty. Same goes for you know, some of these studies and you know, what's, what's, what's the impact of this. Well, our job is not to decide whether something is good or bad that was passed by the legislature. Our job is to decide what was passed by the legislature and, and what they said, the plain meaning of that. So uh, you know, beyond, I think, things you listed, beyond the plain language, uh, solving a dictionary and uh, Canons of statutory interpretation, I, I, I would not look at any of the other stuff. 
Thank you. So follow-up question uh, to the last, to sort of a summary on this. What is your goal as a judge in interpreting statutes? And, uh, and again, answer it however you like. I'll throw out some, some common options or answers. Uh, you know, is it to determine the purpose or intent of legislators at the time of enactment, to enforce the plain text of the law, to assure the law is consistent with current societal understandings and norms, to determine the original public meaning of the law, to assure the most just outcomes, to promote common good constitutionalism, or something else. Again, uh, you're not limited to these. I, I just pulled out what, in ter terms of guiding you, what some of the common answers might be to this question. And we'll return to regular alphabetical order and begin with Justice DeWine. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, our responsibility is to apply the plain text of the language. Uh, it, to me, the plain text is in the context of how it would have been understood to an ordinary speaker of the English language at the time it was enacted. So that's pretty similar to original public meeting. It is really original public meeting. And as far as, as, far as the other things, purpose and intent, uh, our job is to apply the plain language. We, the only way we can know the purpose and intent of what the legislature uh, wanted was what they actually in, in, what they actually enacted. So uh, that's where we get purpose and intent from the plain language. So that's where I am. I'm pretty much the same. Uh, determine the meaning, the original meaning, and uh, plain text. If you go beyond that, there's a problem. In the legislature, just the line touched on this before, one legislative member of the General Assembly may vote for House Bill 16 because their friend voted for their bill, House Bill 17. So to determine intent from something outside the words could mislead and actually create an intent, an unintentional intent. And so you have to focus on what was agreed to. Now sometimes, the Ohio State Legis uh, General Assembly has put in some background information, some statutes started in recent years. So that's different because it's enacted. It's not the wording of the statute, but they put it in. They all voted and agreed upon it. So that's, that's different. But other than that, you can only enforce something based upon the words that were given because that often the legislature has a compromise. And if, they have, if they've compromised and chosen a word based upon compromise, we gotta use that word and not what we think they should have done. Thank you. I believe that you have to enforce the plain text, but because of the 14th Amendment, you have to assure just outcomes as well. You have to read the briefs. You have to understand uh, the case law that has been cited to. I believe precedent is important. And if you apply the statute and go against precedent, you have now created a judicial fallacy. The judiciary is a co-equal branch of the government. Um, and so the legislature has their function um, and their function and their expertise is to write legislation. So when it comes to the judiciary, uh, we should be applying it as it's written. Um, I think the battleground is really when we have a constitutional challenge of that, of that statute. All right, thank you all. Uh, a, a second case comes before the court. This time, there is clear precedent, and it is wrong, very, very wrong. Uh, when, when do you adhere to binding precedent, and when do you depart from it? And we'll, we'll go back to reverse order and begin with Judge, Judge Zayas. Well, if it's very wrong because the plain meeting was not applied, then that would be troubling. But outside of that, um, consistency um, is an important component of justice. And so, that's why we have the doctrine of stare decisis. Judge Jamison. 
when the precedent is wrong, I believe that is when you do not adhere to the binding precedent. Um, as I've already stated, we've seen many laws enacted um, by acts of the judiciary that have equalized treatment for all people across the country. Mm -hmm. And it was determined to be wrong. And because of that, the judiciary acted and equalized the playing field for everyone. I would do an analysis of a civil case. The highest Supreme Court actually has a case, Westfield versus Galatas. And there are four factors, and I can't remember all four of them off the top of my head. But you would go th through that analysis to determine if it's wrong or not, and if, if it's the proper time to overturn the precedent. But assuming it is, you overturn the precedent. If it meets the Galatas factors. In a criminal case, I'm not sure what you mean wrong, but uh, if there's clear precedent the other way, and, you know, you've got to reverse. It, and sometimes that's hard. Sometimes it's hard to reverse, but you have to do it. If, if there was a case where, this was many years ago, when I was a young lawyer, and somebody had left the word not, out of the statute. And it was clear the statute wouldn't make sense. But at first, some courts enforced the law as if the word not was not in there. It didn't make sense. But that would be about the only time that you would stand up and say, this is terrible. Otherwise, you have to do a true analysis. I know there's, can't remember this US Supreme Court case either where you actually go through a set of factors to determine if it's the right time and the right meaning and the right action to reverse something that's been stable law. And also, I mean, you said clear precedent is wrong. I don't know how, two years or 200 years, it, it would matter. That would be a big fact. Yeah, you know, I certainly do not think that we should lightly overturn precedent. Uh, I talked about the need for stability and predictability, but I'm kind of in the Justice Thomas camp. You know, we took an oath, we take an oath not to stare at decisis, but we take an oath to the Constitution. And if something is incompatible, if we've made a decision that's incompatible with the Constitution, our obligation is to re overturn that precedent. So, and, and I've not been unwilling to do so in cases where uh, I've found that to be the case. Uh, you know, th there's a number of considerations that go into uh, whether you should uh, overturn a precedent that you think is, was wrongly decided. You know, one, one thing is, okay, is this, is this a question of the Constitution or is this a statute? If it's a statute, the legislature can fix our mistakes. So you should be less likely to overturn a precedent on a statutory matter than you would on a constitutional one, which is obviously much harder for the people to fix. Uh, you know, in those statutory cases, you think about things like, okay, what are the reliance interests? How much has one party, how, how much has society uh, organized itself around the decision that the court made? Sometimes it's, it's just a case where people need an answer one way or the other, you know, it might be a tax question or something else where predictability is really important. So, you know, what are, what are the reliance interests in what we've decided? Uh, whether or not something is proven to be unworkable. Uh, there, there are some, some decisions that we've made where uh, time has demonstrated that not only are these wrongly decided, but they are causing havoc uh, in our system. We had, we had a case uh, a couple years ago uh, a couple cases where the Supreme Court had a long line of precedent about void sentences, saying that uh, certain criminal sentences were void, the ordinary rules of race judicata didn't apply, uh, and it was creating a lot of problems in our criminal justice system. That was an easy one to say, let's go, let's reverse that precedent because it had been proven uh, unworkable. Uh, so I think those are the kind of things that you know, we have to consider uh, when, when we decide whether or not this is an appropriate case to overrule a prior precedent. 
Thank you. Uh, and this will be my final question. So for those of you in the audience, you can begin queuing up. Uh, barring a conflict with the federal constitution, the Ohio Supreme Court is the ultimate judicial arbiter regarding state constitutional law questions. How would you address cases in which there are nearly identical provisions and in the Ohio and US Constitution and a claim is brought under the Ohio Constitution? Would you simply, if there are precedents interpreting the similar section of the federal constitution, uh, would you adhere to those precedents or would you do an independent analysis of the Ohio Constitution? That's a great question. That's a question that we confront all the time. You have a parallel provision of the state and federal constitution. Uh, you have some case law that says, you know, Ohio is going to follow lock, lockstep what the federal constitution says. Do, do you depart from that? Uh, my view is that when you're looking at that precedent, you have to consider, okay, was this, did the Ohio Supreme Court do any analysis when it announced that they were following the federal precedent, uh, or was it simply, they, it's just a unthought out, uh, unreasoned decision that just says we're blanketly adopting the federal version of the Constitution, which I think is problematic, right? I mean, our, our framers adopted our own Ohio Constitution, uh, it does, it, if you really believe in the federal system, that means that our Constitution deserves to be accorded the status of an independent document. Uh, just because it has the same language or similar language to the Ohio Constitution does not mean that those necessarily mean the same things. And it certainly doesn't mean just because Ohio in 1851 might have decided to echo the language of the federal constitution, it doesn't mean that every, that we have to agree with the way the U.S. Supreme Court has interpreted that provision of the federal constitution and just say, we're going to follow, blindly follow what they decide. So I generally think that uh, we should be doing an independent analysis of, of the Ohio constitutional provisions. I mean, sometimes that's difficult. Our biggest challenge, frankly, is people don't always raise Ohio constitutional claims. And when they do raise them, they don't present, too often they don't present an analysis that's based on text, history, and tradition of the Ohio Constitution. They're more like policy arguments saying, well, we don't like how the US Constitution has been interpreted, so please do something else with Ohio. Well, you gotta give us a reason based on the independent history, text, tradition of Ohio if you, if you want us to do that. I would say ditto, but um, more importantly, at least to me, I agree with everything Justice DeWine just said, but additionally, if the wording is the same, the wording by the US Supreme Court is at best persuasive. It is not mandated on us because we have even the same language. But more importantly, what I don't like what the Supreme Court has done in the past before I got there, is say, okay, we, we, we'll go lockstep with the federal constitution. We don't have the, the Supreme Court of Ohio, the authority, the power to delegate, I call it upward delegation, the interpretation of those words to the federal Supreme Court. We control the Ohio constitutions interpretation and deferring to some other court that could change in a few years or next week. Their interpretation is not within the power and authority of the Ohio Supreme Court because we would be giving away the citizens of Ohio's power to a federal court who's not ruled on their case. I don't think we can do it. I believe that Ohio Constitution and the states have separate rights from the uh, United States. But we do have to look at the interpretation of the Ohio Constitution. We should look at the plain language. And if it is a question of law for our Constitution, it should be ruled on based upon what the voters of Ohio have said. You know, what's interesting about your questions is that it all kind of depends on so many other factors than what your question is actually posing. 
Um, you know, because on the one hand, if we absolutely don't give any deference to the U.S. Constitution, um, that has its own consequences. Uh, it's similar to local localities creating their own laws and saying, well, we can create our own laws and we're secular to the state laws. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, it, it ultimately just depends on what it is that one has before us before I think one can give an, an appropriate answer. All right. Uh, first question from, from Laura. Yeah, I know the shop from the where do you stand on the criminal sentencing database project? Do you support it? I support the criminal sentencing database project. Um, there was a study done by the Ohio Supreme Court on racial fairness and equity that was published in 2002. And unless you collect data, for this state to be able to say what's happening and why it's happening, you do not have adequate information. There are, to my understanding, 61 judges that are participating in that study and making the effort to make sure that justice is equal for everyone, regardless of race, gender, or socioeconomic status. So, so for, for those of you not familiar, there, there is a pilot project set up uh, by the Chief Justice that creates, uh, it was initially intended to create a uh, uniform sentencing entry. Uh, it's, it's, through, it's through the Sen the Ohio Sentencing Commission, which is an independent branch that reports, not branch, but independent agency that reports established by the legislature, not part of the judicial branch. Uh, and the question, uh, and, so, and they, have, they have undertaken this project of developing a uniform sensing entry and uh, quite in collecting data from individual judges based on characteristics uh, of what sentences are imposed, maybe judicial, judicial characteristics of the judges. Uh, it's not quite clear yet what they're doing. For me, the jury is still out. I want to see uh, exactly what the... Uh, procedures are, how, how this is going to be used, what information is going to be collected, how that's going to be shared uh, before I'm ready to incorporate into our rules uh, as a judiciary. I'll go next. Uh, I, I'm not sure what it's supposed to do yet. We've had two administrative court hearings recently and the people involved haven't been able to answer certain questions so it's I, it's kind of a follow-up justice dewine it's unclear what statistics and what information is going to be found for example early on i asked well what documents will be included and the one thing that was expressly said is the pre-sentence report will not be included and yet Almost every trial judge I ask, a big factor on sentencing, huge, is the pre-sentence investigation report. So that you might have on the surface two people charged with the same crime, but if their pre-sentence investigation report is very different, their background, their history of crime, et cetera, you're going to get two different results. But on the surface, it may look unfair, but when you really get down to it. So I, I wish I could answer the question, but they, they haven't been able to answer the question, what factors specifically are going into this? And, and I, I agree, I can't, it's hard to make a decision when you don't know what they're going to do. It's kind of like being asked to, to vote on something before you see it, and it, it's very harsh to do. I might be in favor, might be against, it depends on what they put in it. The Ohio Supreme Court put together a commission over 20 years ago um, to deal with um, disparity, access, perceived and actual bias in the judicial system. Um, within that report, uh, which was published 20 years ago in 2002, was the recommendation for a statewide sentencing database. 
Uh, so this is something that was created um, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. This commission was a statewide commission. It was bipartisan. It included judges. It included attorneys. It included community people. It included people of the cloth. Um, and like I said, this was one of the recommendations that came out of that commission. Um, so answering your question, do I support a sentencing database? Yes, I do. Um, such has been already articulated through the Ohio Supreme Court as something that should be done. That was articulated over 20 years ago. Our current Chief Justice has articulated uh, through a memorandum that she distributed in 2019 that it was one of the initiatives that she, uh, that she wanted for our courts to move into that direction. Um, she's the one that then partnered with UC in order to put this together. Um, you know, keep in mind, my background is technology. I understand databases very well. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about justice, you transparency, consistency, access are all parts of justice. Um, I heard recently a saying, my mom says it in Spanish a little differently, but it's something about sun is the best disinfectant. Um, so when you're dealing with whether it's perceived bias or actual bias, uh, you know, this is one of the things that already was, uh, that predates me well before any campaign or anything <laughs> of, of determining that this was something that we should be adopting as a state. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? In Ohio, we elect our judges, and the federal system, we all know, is a different system. But there are special rules uh, imposed on judges for campaigning. Um, restrictions on fundraising, restrictions on what they can say based on the head of the cannons. Um, I, I would like to know maybe what your thoughts on that are. My view would say I, I'm a lawyer, so I can read cases that have been decided by individual judges, if they've been a judge, and kind of get a feel for what their beliefs are and what their you know, process is. But the average voter, you know, is not going to understand cases that they don't have access to that. How is a voter supposed to decide what judges they should vote for, what these restrictions, do you think they're appropriate, do you think that should change, which is a, a general question on elected judges? I'm just giving deference to you guys first. <laughs> uh, I'll start, sure. Uh, look, people in Ohio value the right to elect their judges. Uh, whether that's good or bad, we can debate. Uh, but I, 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 I think, you know, generally, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, you're, you're right, it is challenging for voters to get more information about judges. I wish that every voter would read our opinions. I wish every voter in Ohio would come to a forum like this one. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, that's not, that's not uh, always going to happen. Uh, you know, certainly, I, I always worry about restrictions on speech uh, that are imposed. And, you know, I, I think sometimes we do tend to, um, to decentivize people from actually talking about the cases we decide and the issues we decide, uh, and you know, we cer you certainly don't want judges uh, who are making commitments as to how they will decide future cases. But I think it is appropriate for judges to talk about cases we have decided, uh, and, and use a few of those to illustrate uh, maybe differences in judicial philosophy. That that's certainly something that I'm. Uh, that I've tried to do and I'm, I'm going to do over the, over the next few months. And I don't think there's anything uh, wrong with, with judges doing that and talking about what those cases are, uh, how they've decided them, and, and why. For the sake of why don't we just go down the line? Okay. Um, when I was president of the bar, state bar, we looked at all the election types because in 1986 or 87, the uh, state of Ohio voted no to changing the way we elect judges. To the, the proposal was called the Missouri Plan, which is the governor uh, uh, nominates, the Senate approves, and then the person runs against themselves two or three years later. That's, that's, and Iowa has it, Missouri, and about 20 states. 
it was defeated 65, 35 or worse. I like being elected. It gives me the authority of the people of Ohio. It gives me that the people are behind me. But those rules are important to a certain extent because you don't want somebody to say, I'm always going to rule this way or that way, or this is what I believe, because each case must be taken on its own facts. There, I, people talk about cases being similar. They are. But I've never seen two cases exactly the same. Never. Even if you have two or three people robbing a bank, the perception of who did what and when differs. And you must take each case on its own facts. And maybe that's from 27 years of private practice. You, you don't want somebody prejudging or having a philosophy of how they're going to rule on certain cases. And so to that extent, I think that slight limitation on a judge's First Amendment rights is OK. Talking about past cases, I'm, I'm glad to do it too. But prejudging is bad for the system as a whole. Well, obviously, I believe um, with the voters that judges should be elected. I do believe that we should have limitations on our speech because I do not believe that you should prejudge issues before they come before the court. And as um, Justice Fisher said, no two cases are alike, even if they're filed for the same reason. You could have 10 people injured in a bus crash and each one could be injured more than the other. So each case is going to have different compensatory damages. Each one is going to have possibly um, different issues. If someone loses sight or is impaired in a different way, they may need a home health aid where someone else is slightly injured and uh, their case is totally different. So I think that we should not give too many broad statements about what we believe because what we believe should not impact how we rule. We should rule on the law and not on what we believe. So I think we have to take it on a case by case basis and be open and give equal act, uh, justice to each case and equal consideration to each case. I agree that the elected system does have challenges, particularly for the voter. Um, it also has some merits. Uh, you know, the elected system allows someone like myself, who's a complete political outsider, to be elected. Would not have happened in the appointed system. Um, and particularly when you're talking about on appellate review, you know, what's the, what's the whole thing of appellate review, right? You want, you want to make sure that everything is not only considered, but that it's understood, that you've considered everything, um, everything is analyzed, everything is discussed, so that the best outcome. Um, so imagine coming to, whether it's the Ohio Supreme Court or one of the appellate district's court of appeals, and you see three or seven people that seemingly seem to have come from the same background, the same circumstances, the same life experiences, how confident are you going to be that you're going to have good review with regard to that case? Um, with regard to discussions of cases, um, you know, the integrity of the court is so important and the confidence of the public. If a judge is talking about, if the, if the judge puts out communications that is telling the public, like, this is what I believe in when it comes to issue-based things. I don't know how the public will have confidence that that judge is going to rule on the facts, on the record, and on the law that comes before that judge, which is what we should be governed by at the end of the day. Um, you know, like I said, the battleground to me is, is the constitutional challenges. That's really where the battleground is. Uh, and, you know, and ultimately, you know, similar to what was already expressed, you know, we bring ourselves to the bench. And what, you know, part of what we're bringing to the bench is also how we see the facts. And how we see the facts oftentimes does determine what is the law that's going to apply as well. 
Thank you so much. Well, I, I see that the red light has come on for me at this point, and uh, I'll have to adhere to that. So, Judge and I will have the last word. Uh, please join me in thanking all of the candidates.